Welcome to the Earn More, Stress Less podcast with me, Caro Sison. This podcast is for self-employed business owners just like you, who really want to grow their business and become successful and profitable, but without all the stress and hassle. I want to share my 30 years of business experience to show you how simple it can be to earn more money and how you can get organized without needing a business degree or any other qualifications. I'll be talking about the easy steps that you can put in place right now to start earning more money today and to help you get the business that you deserve and dream of. Without further ado, let's get started. This week's podcast is sponsored by Pocket PA, helping self-employed business owners to get organized, understand their finances and do their accounts all in one place using a powerful online tool. If you're serious about making a profit and having a successful business, then using a simple digital web app like Pocket PA is the best way to grow and scale your business. Visit pocketpa.com for more details and start managing your money like a pro today. Hello and welcome to the Earn More Stress Less podcast with me, Caro Sison. Thank you so much for listening. Today I have with me Claire Tebbett and she is a marketing and business strategist and is a huge fan of metrics, in particular marketing metrics, that's the numbers. And she helps drive ambitious entrepreneurs just like you to create the freedom and lifestyle that you desire by helping to scale your service-based business. So Claire, hello, welcome to this week's podcast. How are you? Hello. I'm good, thank you. How are you? So I love it that we're both lovers of measuring things. Um, I know that's not everybody's bag, is it? So have you always been a measurer and a looker at numbers? Well, uh, no. I think my maths GCSE teacher would have said definitely not. It's funny how we evolve then, isn't it? Because I've always loved numbers. I've always loved looking below the surface to see what drives things because I'm a huge believer you can't manage what you don't measure. So the numbers never lie. You've got to look at the data. So that's always been something that's really ingrained in me. So that's interesting that that wasn't always a thing for you. No, definitely. It's just when I became a business owner for the first time, that's when um, the numbers started to really fascinate me. It's vital, isn't it? They're so important. Yeah, I didn't. I wanted to know where my business was coming from. I needed to know how many people I needed to. I used to have a photography business. Um, That was my first business of my own. And I was getting plenty of people through the door, but I didn't know where they were coming from. And and therefore, I didn't know where to go out and, and attract more of them. And I didn't know how many people I needed to speak to in order to get that number of people I wanted through the door. So that's when the numbers really became really important to me. Yeah, I think when you start as a, off as a business owner, I think the numbers that you think you need to know is just what's on your bank statement. And it really is just the scratching the surface because your business is all about numbers. It's about the number of clients you have, the different services you offer, the pricing, the the sort of income that you've got, the amount that you're spending, what the profit number is left for you. Everything revolves around numbers, numbers, numbers. And in order for you to generate the income that you want, the actual money that you keep, you have to keep tracking these different numbers. And I think it's so interesting. Like you say, it's fascinating to work back. If I want to earn X amount, what do I need to put into the hopper? How many people do need do I need to attract to come through the door to generate that revenue? You've got to, you can sort of reverse engineer it effectively, can't you, to grow and build your business to the, the sort of number that you want it to, to be, if that makes sense. So can I just ask about your squiggly journey into self-employment? Have you always been self-employed or have you done some other things um, before where you are now? Yeah, no, I haven't always been self-employed. So um, when I first started in the world of work in employment after university, I kind of fell into a marketing job and I totally loved it. I'd basically finished university, wanted to go travelling, hadn't got a clue what I wanted to do. So I just signed up to um, a temping agency. I think it was Office Angels. Um, and they put me into a receptionist job for a week at a design studio. And they said, oh, you obviously don't want to do this for the rest of your life. What do you want to do? And I said, marketing? With a great big question mark at the end. And they said, oh, we, we'll get you a job with the marketing agency you work with. And they did. Um, and I loved it. Um yeah I totally loved it I think I was really good at it um then I kind of moved to the big smoke moved to London um worked for many agencies in London um went traveling and then um kind of met my husband um got married had a child 
And then I thought, oh, I'm not sure this job's going to work anymore because I want to spend time with my daughter. So I asked them if I could go part time and they would agree to four days. But working in a marketing agency is really full on, really fast paced, which is what I loved about it. But then obviously my situation had changed. Um, and although I gave it a go, four days is really like doing five days in four. So um, I thought I'd set up on my own as a photographer because I'd always enjoyed photography and I loved it. Um, and I specialised in newborn um, babies. So it really worked around the life I wanted to have, which was to be obviously be there for my daughter. I had been told that I wouldn't be able to have any more children as well. So it, for me, it was really important to be able to spend the time with her. Um, but three months after leaving the marketing agency, I did actually um, get pregnant when I had a second child. So that was great. Um, but then as the years went by, obviously the kids got a bit older. I got a bit bored doing the photography. Um, and I found that when you do newborn photography, you spend up to four hours with 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 the family, with the parents. And a lot of them were already worrying about what they were going to do work-wise. And they all wanted the flexibility um, that comes with working for yourself. Well, that was the only thing that they could think of because they said, oh, my job won't work, my job won't work. Um, And I just suddenly thought, well, why don't I do marketing? That's obviously what I've done all my life apart from my photography business. And I could help these people have successful businesses um, because obviously they're not all marketeers by trade, which which I was. So that's what made me set up my marketing business. Um, yeah, that's how I got to where I am now. So did you do that alongside? Did you start to get your marketing business back on its feet alongside your photography? Did you run them sort of next to each other for a little while? Or did you just shut the doors one day on your photography business and the next day you were in your marketing role? There was a short overlap. Um, I think it was only about three months um but yeah yeah short overlap and then yeah it's straight into the marketing and I think what you've explained is such a common story where people perhaps begin in an employed role and it, they sort of carry it on. They really enjoy it, but they do it for as long as it suits their lifestyle. And then people have a family and they realise that there has to be some change or flexibility. And when it's not extended in the sort of corporate world or in the sort of employed job, then they have to sort of turn to something else, either a new uh, role or, you know, a new um self-employed idea or a side hustle or some some hobby that they have been pursuing that they can then monetize to to move into that area or to retrain effectively and start a new career and become self-employed um but it's interesting how you began your photography business and then from there you started to notice these other parents that were similar to you previously that were looking for that good fit with their work uh, life balance and you realized that there was a gap in the market to support those people so you reverted then to your previous skill set of your marketing so interesting yeah. And yeah well and obviously I'd had to use the marketing skills in my photography business as well but yeah I mean yeah and also what I found is I do work with a lot of uh parents they're not normally new parents by the time I get to work with them if I'm honest because I think what happens is people start a business and they're obviously got lots of excitement and passion um and they can get so far on their own, um, but then they kind of get stuck. They get stuck at a certain point and they can't grow their business beyond that point and they don't know how to do it. And that's typically when they come to me. But also I found that I'm working with quite a few people who have got um, who maybe haven't got children, but they've got um, older relatives that are starting to need um, extra support and they want the freedom and flexibility around that as well. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So when somebody comes to you to say, you know, I've got my business so far and it just seems to have plateaued, I want to move to the next level. Where do you start with them, Claire? What's the first step that you need to to do to work out where they are at this point? OK, so it's just look, looking at where they are now to, to kind of do an audit and take stock. So looking at their numbers, um, I kind of have this um analogy around Google, uh, not Google Analytics, I've got Google Analytics on the brain because I've just been looking at it for a client, um, Google Maps. So I think Google Maps is very like a marketing strategy. So you use Google Maps, or I do, when I'm driving somewhere that I've never driven before. And the first thing it'll do is ask you where you want to go. 
That's like having your goals in your business. But to get you to where to get you there, it then asks you where you are now so that it can can take you there. And that's what you need to do with your marketing strategy. You need to see where you are now. So you need to do an audit of, of your marketing, where your where those leads are coming from, where the clients are coming from, because there's lots of businesses that I review actually, like they might get the vast majority of their leads from Facebook, but actually the paying clients are coming from somewhere else. Um, so it's making sure that you know exactly what's happening where. Um, and that's what I always start with by reviewing the metrics. So you do this gap analysis effectively. You find out where they want to get to and then you work out where they are now. And you can then see, you know, how many miles it is if you're using your um, Google Maps yes, analogy, yeah. how many miles. And then you can evaluate, I suppose, what sort of means of transport they've got, what sort of budget, how much time they've got to be able to work out, you know, whether they've exactly. got a big the budget. Yeah. And they can go by jumbo jet or helicopter private jet <laughs> yeah. or whether they're going to be needing to get their bicycle out and dusting off their pedals <laughs> or, or even walking uh, depending on if the resources are really tight I suppose but I suppose similarly to that with Pocket PA for for me I'm always about saying you know if you want to get to Scotland um, really fast you're going to be using the motorway you don't need to take the A roads you don't need to sort of hitchhike or that sort of thing why would you want to do it with multiple tools when you've got one tool that does it all that will get you there much faster but I think sometimes people like the scenic route or you know they they want to smell the coffee and and check the flowers out on the way but a lot of people are quite impatient and they want to get to their destination ASAP as fast as possible but sometimes there's that sort of push pull balance of resources time budget etc that in you know that has to be sort of a resource that people need to have available so if somebody comes to you and they think they don't have any metrics does everybody have metrics they just might not be aware of them when they get started because if I spoke to um, a few business owners that I know and I said you know share with me your metrics they'd be like you know what what are you talking about I've just got my bank statement yeah yeah exactly yes so if you do social media you've got metrics if you send emails you've got metrics Um, if you've got a website you've got metrics Um, you just might not ever look at them which a lot of business owners don't because they're especially in the service-based industry because they're so busy delivering the service whether it's plumbing photography beauticians whatever it is they're so busy delivering it because that's obviously what brings in the money they don't have the time to look at the metrics but if you look at the metrics it saves you time and gets you to your destination quicker because it allows you to look at what's working so you just amplify that and do more of it or if you can see that something isn't working you either stop it or you can see if it's got any tweaks that can be made to optimize it and get it to perform better for you. So if anybody has a website, do they will they automatically have this information being collected or would they need to have had it um, connected up to Google Analytics right at the get go? What happens if they had missed off that stage? Perhaps they've done their own website. Will they always have that sort of metrics being calculated or would there be an extra step that they might have had to have done that they may not have initiated right at the get-go? Okay, so yes. So it does depend, if if they, Google Analytics, we talk about Google Analytics because it's kind of like the main analytic tool that people use, but obviously there are others available. I sound like the BBC. Um, <laughs> so if they if Google Analytics hasn't been set up to their website, then they won't have the data. However, if they've got a Wix site or another site like that that has their own inbuilt analytical tools, then they may well have the data. But if they have just their own website, um, it's not too late. They could get um, connected to Google Analytics any time yeah, you could help them yeah. with that. And then they could start collecting that yeah. for you to analyze that at a slightly yeah. later date down the road. Absolutely. It's never too late to add it. There's, there's an old saying about when was the best time to plant an oak tree 500 years ago the next best time is today um yeah just start just start just start um, yes yeah yes but, i mean even in even if you haven't got a website because lots of businesses when they first start out don't have a website they just have a social media presence um the first thing to do is just open an excel spreadsheet now that might scare some people so just get out pad and pad and pen um, and just start asking people if when they come through the door say if you're a beautician or something just ask people oh how did you hear about us 
Now, imagine in that industry, a lot of it is word of mouth marketing, which is fabulous because it's free. Um, but the problem with that is you can't harness it if you don't know where it's coming from. But anyway, I, I'm, get, I'm digressing. So, yeah, pad and pen. Just ask, start asking people, where did you hear about us? Make a note of it. And then you're just kind of tracking where your business is coming from. Um, and then you just start from there. Just start simple. So what do you do with those numbers once you have things all filled in on your spreadsheet and somebody says to you, right, this is this is how many clients I have. This is where they've they've come from, et cetera. What's the next step for you? OK, so the next step is analysing those numbers. So I've got um, an acronym. I've got a clear, a clear system, it's called. So C is collate. So you collate all the information. L is learn. So you learn from what the numbers are telling you because some people can obviously misconstrue maybe what the numbers are telling you, or I think you alluded to it earlier about digging deeper, because sometimes if you don't dig deep enough with the numbers, it gives you um, the wrong impression. So you always have to dig a bit deeper. E, evaluate what you're going to do. A of clear is uh, action. So action, what you've decided you're going to do. And then R is review. So once you've got those numbers, you have to analyze them. So let's say, I don't know, let's say you're a plumber and let's say, I don't want to pick plumbing. Um, let's say you, you've worked out that, um, I don't know, 20% of your clients are coming from word of mouth. 20% are coming from um, an advert in a local parish magazine. Um, let's say 20% are coming from Google ads. And how many have got 20, 40, 60? And then 40% are coming from um, Google My Business. So then you know where your, your leads are coming from. Oh, it's not your leads, your actual paying clients. Then you can look to see, okay, well, so if 20% um, are coming from my Google ads, that's obviously going to be the most expensive way to bring people in. And it's not, it's only bringing in the same amount as everything else. So perhaps I could advertise in another parish magazine, which would be a lot cheaper than Google ads, for instance. Um, so it just helps you work out where to focus your time and your money so that you can spend less time and money on the things that don't work and more time on the things that do work, which actually then saves you time because you're actually focusing your efforts rather than doing a, I hate this phrase, but I can't think of a better one, spray and pray approach and trying a bit of everything. You're focusing and just doing the few things that you know that work. Yes, it's like crossing your fingers and just hoping that things are all going to work yeah, out, exactly. isn't it? But that's really just a burying your head in the sand, really. And I think people get a little bit complacent. They accept the level of income that they're at and they kind of are just that they kind of get into a groove, I suppose. And you you you, you realize that if you're going to have to grow, you're going to have to do some effort and, you know, take some action and stuff. And people are like, oh, I'm not really sure. Life's not too bad. I'm just about making do. And then a pain point comes and they need to escalate and increase their income because they have another outgoing or energy bills increase or we have a higher cost of living, et cetera. And people are now, I think, realizing that they're having to gear up and actually review their business to start generating extra income. And it's not just about perhaps um, adding an extra two or three pounds to their prices um, for each, each client. It's actually another way to grow their business because they've got spare capacity that they're not working at their max with all their hours per week, et cetera. So if they were to do two or three hours extra per week and fill that capacity a little bit, that again could increase their revenue. But in order to do that, it may be that they need extra clients coming through the door to grow their list a little bit. Perhaps that might be a situation. Yes. And well, one situation I find that I come up against a lot is that um, business owners say they're too busy to put a strategy and a plan into place, or they're too busy to look at their metrics. But if they took the time to do that, it would ultimately save them so much time um, and make them more money because they're actually working to a, to a plan which has been checked against their goals um, and which helps keep them focused. 
We have a goal setting strategy, um, not strategy, but a goal setting tool, sorry, in Pocket PA, which is really helpful. And there are five different things that you can actually set. So you can um, set your goal based on your um, your actual income coming in or your profit, which is obviously um, your income minus your expenses. So you can focus specifically on the actual net profit that you've got. Um, also, you can track it based on the number of hours you're working or the number of appointments. So there are various different things that you can set to actually measure because my belief is it's all very well having a goal. But if you don't look at it for three months and then you have to dust it off, you know, that goal should be front and foremost in your you know, your sight line every single day. So if you're opening Pocket PA every single day, it will tell you as you enter data into Pocket PA exactly where you are on that timeline of being able to achieve or not achieve to motivate or give you a little kick up the backside to sort of say, you know, you're way off if you've got your metric and you can see you're only a quarter and you're supposed to be, you know, 75% based on where you are through the month. That's a really visual cue to think, oh my goodness, I'm not on track for what I set myself. Um, and if you set yourself, you know, a target for the year, it will also break it down in pocket PA to what you need to be earning. For example, if it's an income one, what you need to be earning per month and then breaks it down further per week. And it will tell you if you're on track or not. So those continuous reminders, I think it's you're absolutely right. It's that review process. It's all very well having a plan. Um, but if you're not reviewing and seeing how you're measuring up against it, then you're not really being accountable, are you? No, and that's that's so true. And I'm really glad you've brought that up because a plan isn't a one time thing only. Just like Google Map Google Maps going back to that, you know, if you put in your destination and then suddenly there's a horrendous um traffic jam on the motorway, Google Maps will reroute you to still get you, you there the quickest way possible. And that's what a plan's about. So if somebody is checking in pocket PA and they think, oh gosh, actually I'm way off my income target. OK, what can I what can I do? I'll go back to my plan. Oh, actually, I haven't been implementing my plan is quite often um, a popular thing uh, or a common thing. Or, OK, perhaps the plan needs to change or I need to change the plan now because something isn't working. So it's a living, breathing thing. And as long as it's aligned kind of like to your strategy, that's great. As well, another thing I find is that people are sometimes resistant to doing putting a strategy or plan into place because it's pushing them out of their comfort zone. But as we know, like the best kind of growth happens when you are just a little bit out of your comfort zone. In your stretch um, zone. I like to just call it your stretch zone because because I think, you know, I've been listening um, to a few people talking about this sort of comfort zone recently. And I totally align with the idea is that we operate best when we're in our comfort zone because it, you know, it is just that our comfort zone. And as soon as you start to take someone out of their comfort zone, it can often create anxiety um, and they perhaps may not perform the best. So I think it's a greater idea to actually stretch your comfort zone zone to be working just on that perimeter on that edge to get yourself into a position where you feel capable of being able to achieve those additional goals but you're not so scared and you know reticent to actually move into that outside my comfort zone area and you then don't take any action because you feel so overwhelmed and stressed by the situation that you're being asked to asked of in in that extra space that wasn't comfortable for you that's really nice i'm going to adopt that Crazy. Oh, <laughs> you're very welcome. I, I, I've I've listened a lot. There's um there's an amazing lady, uh, Lizzie Barrett Jackson, and she also talks about comfort zones, and I really align with her thought process um about that. That we operate best in our comfort zone, yeah. and by taking people, I, you know, there's all these people. Oh, face the fear and do it anyway, and it kind of makes you feel a bit inadequate, and you think, oh my god, I don't want to have the pants scared off me to be able to achieve these goals. That isn't kind of why I became self-employed. Nobody wants to sort of wake up fearful every morning no. so I'm I'm a bigger believer of working inside your comfort zone but if you're wanting to grow to move to the perimeter and bring those things that might just seem slightly outside your comfort zone you know getting that support to be able to achieve them and cross over that line or dance on that line of your comfort zone and widen your comfort zone in a way that feels comfortable for you. And suddenly by expanding your comfort zone, you're embracing further things that you thought were, you know, a little bit further beyond you, I suppose. 
but nobody nobody wants to get into the panic zone. <laughs> so you've got your comfort zone, your stretch zone, and then this panic zone at further outside. And I just think, oh my goodness, you know, that th- there are some coaches that that insist on you diving straight into your panic zone. And those are the those are the ones that I think people are scared to work with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So tell tell our listeners if you're able to, I know you've got um some different tools that you work with, and uh, we're gonna put a link to them in in the show notes. So what's one of the tools that you're going to um share? with us today okay so um, I have a metrics calculator so I know lots of people are scared by by maths and numbers um so I have created a metrics calculator so I've talked about kind of like the data like where you can go to find the original data but things like conversion rates is like a real good marketing metric to measure and I'd say that's the one got a percentage in it hasn't yeah. it <laughs> That's the one you want to start with. That's what that's what yeah. stresses a lot of people. It's that word percentage. How the heck do you work out a percentage? But it is the rate you need to know for, for basically almost everything. Um, so I have created uh, this calculator. It's all pre-calculated for you. So if you want to know your conversion rates, it tells you what actual numbers you need to plug in. And then it automatically calculates the answer for you. And that's for lots of numbers. I mean conversion rates return on investment um and other scary things like that but they're not scary really they're the things that you need for your business yeah I think it's just about understanding and explaining them once you once you see it but just exactly the same with pocket PA you become a data enterer don't you when you use these sorts of yeah. tools so although it might look you know a bit spreadsheety and a bit bit nerve-wracking it's just asking you for very specific numbers for you to enter those in and then it works the things out for you at the end and then it delivers that information in a way that you can easily digest and understand. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so important because yeah, numbers is just one of those things, dyscalculia, which is um something that my my daughter has, where you have these spreadsheets and numbers and percentages and all these sorts of things. They're just they are outside the comfort zone and it's totally fine. It's no different to somebody with dyslexia that you know, read something and the, and the words and letters all get jumbled up. It's just the way our brains are, are programmed sometimes. And, you know, a lot of people get hot under the collar and sweaty palms around numbers and, and spreadsheets and opening bank accounts and looking. And when people also start to talk um, in sort of these, these grown up terms that people that use, I suppose, things like, you know, profit, loss, accrual, trial balances, words that are outside of their comfort zone that accountants regularly use that presume everybody knows, those sorts of things, um, you know, you you talked about ROI, return on investment. And for, for a lot of people, that's quite a new term or they're like, oh, I don't even know what that is. And so they put the sort of metrics into camps where, oh, that's for people that understand numbers and I'm not one of those people. But or for grown-ups. Yes, for grown-ups, like adulting or whatever it is. Yeah, I'm still not a yeah grown-up. but yeah. when you're a business owner, you already are a grown-up. And if somebody is explaining something in a way that you don't understand and using abbreviations and all of those sorts of things, then the onus is on them to unpack it and explain it to you because that you know you're you're the client in, in that instance, and you should have information explained to you in a way that doesn't make you feel small or marginalized, or you know, that you're the thicky in the room because you're absolutely not. You're running a business, you're smashing it but you might need some support and assistance just with sort of growing it to the next level or understanding numbers in a way um, that you can process them so I think it's really important that you speak up absolutely because we can't all be experts at everything you know you might be a you know a fabulous photographer but it doesn't mean to say you've got to be a fabulous accountant or a fabulous marketer although I would say business owners if you know an entrepreneur you do you do have to be good at marketing um to have a really you have to wear a you have to wear a few hats I think for sure but you don't have to be an expert absolutely exactly that look at that we're singing off the same you don't have to be experts and you yeah you shouldn't expect to be and I I'm sorry if I said ROI I did say ROI oh don't worry I think I I hate acronyms because yeah because they're all about confuse they're all they're confusing and I'm all about clarity and that's another reason why I like metrics because I think they provide you with a really clear path to follow um 
So yeah. But it's lovely how you have a you know you're you're here to provide that with marketing and holding somebody's hand to enable them to sort of navigate that area of it if it's not their area of expertise which for to, let's face it to be honest if we're a business owner and we're specializing in you know whether it's beauty or a trade or whatever it is you know that's where we're a specialist and an expert exactly. not in having a maths degree or an accountancy qualification or a, being a bookkeeper or whatever we have to do those things to a certain base level but then we bring in an expert expert or get some help from somebody like yourself, Claire. No, that, that makes total sense. So thank you for sharing all of that. That's so interesting. If our listeners would like to find out more about you and connect, where is the best place for them to be able to find you, Claire? Okay. So they can find me on Instagram at Claire Tebbit online. Claire doesn't have an I. Um, and Tebbit is T-E-B-B-E-T-T. Lovely. I swear I wish I had a really easy name to spell. <laughs> Um, or they can find me on my website, which is claretevitt.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. Lovely. Well, thank you for joining me this week. And also thanks for listening and have a wonderful week and let's catch up soon. Thanks for listening to the Earn More Stress Less podcast with me, Caro Sison. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then do hit subscribe so we can catch up again soon. And please kindly leave a review if you've got a moment and share with anyone else that you think this podcast could help on their self-employed journey. If you're ready to make bigger breakthroughs in your business life and want to get way more organized and understand your finances the really simple way, then start your very own 14-day free trial today using the super powerful software tool Pocket PA that I made for my own son and daughter. Go to pocketpa.com forward slash podcast and let's get you on the way to earning more money and stressing much less. Have a great week, whatever you're doing.